Hi everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Audrey Cernak. I'm a cardiologist at Christiana Care and part of Christiana Care Cardiology Consultants. And I'm here today for our Facebook Live to talk about women and heart disease. And we're here to talk about women and heart disease today because it's the number one killer of women. And we're here to talk about it because many of us don't recognize it's our number one threat. One out of three women will die of heart disease. There's a woman who dies uh, almost every minute from heart disease. Part of the reason we talk about the problem is that heart disease may not affect women the same way that it affects men, and it may not affect all women in the same way. So I'm here to try to answer some questions and talk about the issues. And I'm happy to take your questions and get things started. So our first question is coming from Amy B. in New London, Pennsylvania. And Amy asks, are women at a higher risk for heart disease than men? It's a great question, Amy. Um, and some of that really does depend on your age. And it turns out that um, at the older we are as women, our risk is in fact higher than men. So our lifetime risk turns out to be more than men. But at any individual age, our risk may not be. So it's a little complicated, but it is why at every yearly visit when you see your physician, you should be talking about your risk factors and heart disease so that you can understand where at your point in life you are and what your risk for heart disease is. Take another question. Our next question comes from Jen S. in Smyrna, Delaware. And it says, what can I do to reduce my risk of heart disease? Well, Jen, I think the most important thing is to begin by understanding what your risk of heart disease is. And that means that you need to have a conversation with the physicians that are helping take care of you, whether that's your primary care doctor, and by the way, I do encourage every woman to have a primary care doctor, or your OBGYN, if that's who you're seeing regularly, to at least get the ball rolling. You need to understand some things about who you are. You need to understand what your risk factors are so that you can understand how to modify them. In the most basic sense, we should all be more active, eat more healthy, and not smoke, and then we need to control our other risk factors. And I think we'll have a lot of questions today that talk about risk factors, and so we can talk about them more in depth maybe with some of our other questions. We have a question from Aaron C. in Newport, Delaware. Aaron asks, if heart disease runs in your family, how can you stay healthy and prevent it? Yeah, Aaron, you know the old saying, can't choose your family. <laughs> and unfortunately, you can't choose your family. And if your family has a um, history of early heart disease, and that means that if you are a woman less than 65 or a man less than 55, you have by definition a family history of early heart disease. And you need to be particularly vigilant. If heart disease runs in your family, we take that into account when we look at the other risk factors that you have. You need to think about the risk factors for heart disease in two categories. There are the risk factors that you can work on and the risk factors that unfortunately are what they are. The risk factors that are what they are, well, they're the genes that you inherited from your parents. And at this point, <clears throat> we don't yet know enough about what genes cause heart disease to be able to test your parents and see whether you inherited them or didn't inherit them. What else can't we change that's a risk factor for heart disease? Well, we can't change how old we are. The older we are, the more likely we are uh, to have heart disease. Um, those are probably the big ones that we think about we also then have the things that we know we can change. So, how active we are. We're learning more and more every single day about how we all need to be more active. I think my favorite new phrase is that, um, you know, inactivity is the new smoking. Um, it turns out that it's probably just as bad for us. And a very interesting article just published this past week looking at we as women, in fact, are even more at risk than we're in when we're inactive than our male counterparts. Turns out to affect us even more than it affects them. So we can become more active. We can get in regular exercise. And I'm sure along the way, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. We can not smoke. That's something well within our control and extremely important. We can know what our other numbers are. We should know what our blood pressure is, and we should know whether we need to be on medications to control our blood pressure. We need to know if we have diabetes, and if we have diabetes, we need to have good control of our blood sugar. And then we need to know what our cholesterol is. 
and we need to manage our cholesterol, either with diet and lifestyle changes or with medications, if you and your physician feel that's appropriate. A long answer, Jen, but I hope it helps. Next question. Rose M. from Wilmington asks us, how much exercise is recommended to keep your heart healthy? Well, Rose, I very simply say to my patients, I'll take anything you'll give me. <laughs> and I think it's a fair answer. That is that it seems to me that no matter what little things we can add back in, they all make a difference. The current recommendation is that we get exercise at least five days a week for 30 minutes. Seems daunting. Um, you need to remember though that the recommendations don't mean you need to get all of your exercise in one sitting. So if you add 10 minutes in in the morning, 10 minutes at lunch, and 10 minutes when you get home of brisk walking, um, you'll meet your time guideline. It does not have to be in one stretch. But remember to add in the easy things. Always take the stairs. Don't take the elevator. Park your car as far away from where you're going to shop so that you walk all the way into the store. Try to get up and keep active during the day, and all of those things uh, will make a difference. Donna M. from Wilmington asks us, are there any tests to help detect heart disease? There are, Donna, and that's a complicated question and very challenging to answer in a simple fashion. I tell people that our current information suggests that just detecting heart disease itself may not necessarily have any value in people who aren't having symptoms. So I encourage people to take a step back and say, what I really need to do is understand, as we talked about before, your risk factors for heart disease. Testing for those is important. Because whether you do or don't have heart disease, managing those risk factors makes a big difference. So what I need to see from somebody are the things we talked about before. I want to know their blood pressure. I want to know uh, what their cholesterol looks like. I want to know if they're a smoker and I want to know their family history so that we can talk about managing those things to either prevent any worsening of heart disease if they already have it or prevent the development of heart disease if they haven't yet gotten it. I hope that helps as well. Kathy H. from Newcastle, Delaware asks, how does menopause affect heart health? Yeah, well, what we clearly know, Kathy, is that after we go through menopause, we are far more likely to have heart disease and heart disease problems. Um, in fact, I think you can see our nice poster from the American Heart Association shows us that that is a unique risk factor for women going through menopause. I will say that we probably don't completely understand why or what happens. We do understand that there are certain cholesterol changes that happen when we go through menopause and that in some way, as we lose the protective effect of some of our hormones when we go through menopause, our blood vessel health in general may suffer. There was a lot of work done in the early 2000s, late 90s, looking at giving women back hormones and saying, okay, well, if that's the problem and we go through menopause, then let's just give women estrogen or estrogen and progesterone if necessary, and I'll bet we'll stop heart disease. And it turned out we didn't. Uh, in fact, we increased complications in women by choosing to do that, at least in the method that we did it in at that time frame. And so it turns out we don't really know the whole answer of why menopause causes problems. I do, however, encourage women and say that just because you had a normal cholesterol profile in the past, your cholesterol profile should be checked frequently. And especially if you are going through menopause or have gone through menopause, make sure you get your lipids checked again and make sure that you're on top of any changes that might have happened. The next question is a long one from Kim S. in Middletown, Delaware. Kim says, I've heard many women don't get classic symptoms prior to a heart attack. What are some of the symptoms to be aware of? I think many women do experience classic symptoms, so let's start with them and then we'll talk about the people who have non-classic symptoms. Classic symptoms are chest pain, chest pressure underneath your breastbone, shortness of breath, pain in your jaw, pain in your shoulders. Those are the traditional locations for chest pain when people think about their heart. Many women, I think, do experience those symptoms. They are sometimes frequent uh, and quick to minimize those symptoms and pretend that they think there is not a problem 
or choose not to talk about those symptoms with their doctor. So I think that's one important group. And so we do need to be aware of those typical symptoms and watch for them. Then there are the atypical symptoms that I think can occur in many populations, including women. Part of the problem with heart disease in women is that we tend to experience heart disease as we get much older. And we, when we're a lot older, we're a whole lot less active. And when we're less active, we're less likely to develop typical symptoms because we're not doing anything and we're not getting around. Older women are more likely com to complain of a discomfort more in the middle of their stomach, some nausea, generalized fatigue, symptoms that are vague that occur when they get around and are active. Um, those are the things to watch for. In general, I say to people, your best offense is a good defense. So be out there and be active so that you will have an early warning sign and you will be able to let your doctor know that something's changing in the amount that you're able to get around and do and that something isn't quite right. Melody S. from Wilmington, Delaware gives us our next question and she asks, is low blood pressure bad for your heart? Well, blood pressure is probably not bad for your heart. We, especially as women, have the tendency to run quote, low blood pressure. Uh, that is lower than our defined normals. We kind of have to remember that a defined normal uh, is sort of a group that we came up with and said, well, if I measure most men and most women in a pool, this is largely where their blood pressure is going to live. As long as you're not lightheaded or you're not dizzy or having symptoms from low blood pressure in general, we just consider it to be you. Sometimes, especially if it's new, doctors may think that it requires some sort of evaluation or workup, why all of a sudden your blood pressure, which used to be 120 over 80, is now running 90 on the top number. But if that's just been you your whole life, most people would say that's sort of who you are. As you get older, the natural tendency is for blood pressure to go up. And so you may see as you get older or go through menopause that your blood pressure returns more to a value that we would consider to be normal. Jerry K. from Newark, Delaware asks us, how does chemotherapy affect your heart? Good question, Jerry. Um, we are learning more and more every single day about how chemotherapy can affect your heart. Uh, we at Christiana have a relatively brisk women and heart disease program, and we've paired and partnered closely with our oncology colleagues to be seeing our women who are receiving chemotherapy that we think has a very high risk for affecting their heart. Traditionally, chemotherapy has been um, associated with a change in heart function and can cause heart failure. Um, sometimes that change in heart function is reversible. Uh, sometimes it is not reversible. There are additional risk factors in addition to the type of chemotherapy that a woman is receiving that make it more or less likely for her to have a problem with her chemotherapy. Some of the newer chemotherapies are also associated with some very unique heart side effects, um, including inflammation that affects the heart um, based on the way that those chemotherapies work. Uh, in addition, there are some chemotherapies that can cause problems with blood pressure and can make women very hypertensive with high blood pressures, um, and we need to watch those uh, very closely. Tina C. from Wilmington, Delaware says, should I be worried about a high lipoprotein level? Uh, yeah, good question. <laughs> I think the answer is Probably. Um, there is some data that suggests that a high lipoprotein A level um, is worse uh, than having a normal lipoprotein A level. Most of us as cardiologists, I think at this point, based on the data, are still taking it into account as a risk factor. That is that we sort of bundle it into our decision making about what we should do whether we should be more or less aggressive with medicine to treat people's cholesterol because that particular part is high, or whether we think their overall risk uh, profile still remains relatively low and we just kind of watch it. So it is another one on the list and I would say that some of the information still remains a little unclear about exactly what to do with that. I would also say that we don't have any medications that specifically target just the lipoprotein A level, which makes it a little bit challenging. So we try to figure out how to work it into our entire um, treatment protocol. 
Angie P. from Newark, Delaware says, I survived a heart attack years ago, but feel the cholesterol meds are harmful. Is there an alternative to cancer-causing meds besides atorvastatin? So uh, for those who aren't familiar, atorvastatin is Lipitor, um, which many people have heard about and are more familiar with the name. And Lipitor belongs to a class of medications called statins. Um, Angie, I would say that um, the data as to whether or not statins cause cancer still remains um, equivocal at best. Um, there are many studies that demonstrate there is no increase in cancer risk uh, with cholesterol medicines like statins. There are a few studies um, that have indicated that there may be an increased risk of cancer. Many of those studies have been reanalyzed, and it seems as though part of the problem is that the data was a bit confusing because the way the studies were put together, um, they found that in people who had very low cholesterol levels, there was an increased risk of cancer. And that may be because our cholesterol levels fall when we have cancer. So we might have had a confusing message out of the study rather than it was the drug. All that said, um, there are a lot of concerns for a variety of side effects that go with any number of medications. Um, statins have had a lot of questions. People ask whether they do or do not improve dementia or problems with thinking. People are worried that they may increase their risk of developing diabetes. There is the question as to whether or not they cause cancer. When you see your physician and talk about medications to take, you should be balancing the risk with the benefits. And so what we clearly know in somebody who's had a heart attack is that there is a huge benefit to taking a cholesterol-lowering medicine after a heart attack. There's about a 40% relative risk reduction over the next five years in another heart event in people who take cholesterol-lowering medicines. It's a relatively staggering number in somebody who's already had an event. All that said, you should be having a conversation with your physician and say, these are the things I'm concerned about, and your physician can say, these are the things I think are the benefits, and together you should make a decision about what therapy is available for you. I will say there are other cholesterol-lowering medicines besides statins. There are, there's a medicine called Sedia, which is available. Um, and then there are these new medications, which many of us have seen advertised on TV, these new injectable medications to lower cholesterol. Those medications are indicated to be used with a statin. They are not indicated to be used by themselves. But every single day, new therapies are available to lower cholesterol, and it should be an ongoing conversation between you and your physician. Faye W. from Wilmington asks us, is frequent heartburn a symptom of possible heart problems? Well, Faye, I think that really depends on whether it's actually heartburn or whether it is angina or pain coming from your heart. And I tell people that I see frequently that um, those symptoms can be sometimes indistinguishable. Um, I love to tell my patients the story that when I was 30 and had just joined my first practice, which was in Texas, we ate a lot of barbecue, had barbecue for lunch one day, <laughs> and I have a lot of stomach problems, went to exercise with one of my partners uh, and started to develop severe heartburn. Um, and he looked at me and told me I really didn't look very good. And I told him that if I was not a 30-year-old woman, I would have been in an emergency room telling somebody I was having a heart attack. So stomach symptoms can feel just like a heart attack and can be just as intense as a heart attack. So what I encourage people to do is if you're having symptoms that you think are heartburn, at least talk to your doctor and make sure they think they are heartburn as well. We can treat heartburn and we should be able to make heartburn go away with medicines and make people feel better. If they think you have a lot of risk factors or they're suspicious that it's not heartburn, uh, then they might decide that they need to make sure that this pain isn't coming from your heart and you should be evaluated. Susan H. from Wilmington asks us, what types of food are good for heart health? Healthy foods are good for heart health. They're the hardest to eat, I think. Um, I think what's pretty clear, uh, that reasonable diets, low in saturated fat, low in salt, high in fruits and vegetables, um, and, unsat and um, simple uh, fats and oils like olive oil. If you wanted to substitute a label, that's gonna be the Mediterranean diet that we hear so much about. Lean proteins, fruits and vegetables, and olive oils. It's an extremely healthy diet. 
Um, if somebody listening happens to be a diabetic, I generally also tell them that most of the recommendations that you're going to get to help control your blood sugar will also give you a diet that is extremely heart healthy. I also encourage all of my patients, I think all the data and information has told us that you need to find something that is livable as a solution for your diet and trying to eliminate all of the things that you think are unhealthy is unlikely to be sustainable in the long term. Everything in moderation is a great answer and a great solution. There's nothing that you should say you should never eat or never have. Just do it extremely infrequently and in small portions and try and focus on the things that we know are good for us. Pam G from Wilmington, Delaware says, does smoking increase your risk of heart disease? And the answer to that, Pam, is absolutely. And it turns out that smoking disproportionately increases the risk in women compared to men. So if you take a male smoker and estimate his increased heart risk, it goes up. But if you take a female smoker, hers goes up even more. I tell my patients every single time I see them in the office, if I have to pick one thing for them to do, it's quit smoking. Um, I will tell, if they tell me they don't take their medicines, if they tell me they don't exercise, I'm not happy. But if I can get them to quit smoking, they make the single greatest impact on their overall life and, and reduction in heart disease. So an extremely important thing to do. And I'll add a quick side note because I will say, obviously we've gone to sort of smokeless tobacco with things like Juul and all of this vaping. We have limited to no data about what that does to heart risk, it's not really clear how much of what's in the cigarette contributes to risk of increasing heart disease. Is it all the nicotine? Is it the other byproducts in the cigarette? We really don't know. So I cannot tell my patients at all that these new alternatives are any safer um, than smoking. So I encourage you to quit it all entirely. Kelly B from Newark asks, um, do women experience different symptoms with heart disease compared to men? Uh, yeah, Kelly, again, I think, and it's important to go over it again, I think we do experience different symptoms. We can experience typical symptoms. And so you kind of want to watch out for the things like arm, neck, jaw, back pain, true chest pain. I always say that we as health providers are a bit lazy and ask people about chest pain. Pain to most people means a sharp stabbing, something along those lines. And when we ask for pain, the answer is frequently no, because what they don't experience is pain. They experience some sort of discomfort, either a tightness, a fullness, a heaviness. I say, don't be lazy like us. If we say pain, answer back, not pain, but I feel tightness, heaviness, pressure, those sorts of things. Fill in the blanks for us and make sure you don't get your symptoms um, ignored. And then in addition, sort of as we talked about, some of the more unusual or atypical things can be that women may just feel like they're more short of breath. They may get some nausea, vomiting, um, and then sometimes they get lightheaded or dizzy when they exert themselves, and that can be um, an, an infrequent but possible marker. Jennifer B. from Wallingford, PA says, how does high cholesterol affect my heart? Oh, I'm glad you asked that, Jennifer. I bought a model because I thought it might be helpful. Um, we should remember that our heart uh, is a, as a blood vessel, has blood vessels that feed it. Our muscle requires oxygen to be delivered to the muscle um, to be able to live. And our blood vessels that deliver the oxygen and the blood um, kind of look at their tube and they have layers to them. And what will happen is that as time goes on, our cholesterol builds up underneath and between the layers in the blood vessels that feed our heart. And ultimately, that will lead to the fact that we do not have enough room for blood to go through the blood vessel any longer narrow blood flow and narrow oxygen delivery to our heart and cause either a warning sign of a heart attack or cause a heart attack itself if the heart uh, doesn't get enough oxygen for a period of time. Next question comes from Jerry Kay in Newark, Delaware. Is a vegan or vegetarian diet good for your heart? Uh, I actually think that recent data says that it is. Um, and that is that uh, cutting down on animal protein, increasing our fruit and vegetables appears to be extremely important. Um, as always, I generally say that if somebody is going to go to the extremes of a vegan diet, do make sure that you don't wind up deficient in certain necessary vitamins. I would work with a dietitian to make sure you get the important things in into your diet. 
Uh, same goes for vegetarians. Make sure that you're able to get in all of the necessary vitamins uh, and minerals in your diet. But certainly those diets have been proven to be beneficial for people who have heart disease um, or who are trying to prevent heart disease. And it looks like uh, we're gonna have time for just one last question. Uh, and that question comes from Katie P. in Wilmington, Delaware. And Katie says, I have a family history of congestive heart failure. What are critical factors to prevent it? Katie, you raise an important uh, issue that all heart disease is not heart attacks. We tend to spend a lot of time talking about cholesterol and heart attacks, but we should remember that heart disease includes high blood pressure, it includes heart failure, it includes funny heart rhythms, uh, and it includes um, uh, so a couple of other issues as well. You bring up the issue of, of congestive heart failure. Um, congestive heart failure can have multiple reasons. When we have congestive heart failure, what happens is that our heart function is not particularly strong any longer, or we may have a variety where our heart doesn't relax very well, and in both cases we tend to hold on to fluids and have problems either with shortness of breath or leg swelling. Both of those diseases uh, have different reasons why people to develop heart failure. So when you see your doctor, one of the most important things to examine and understand is why your family member developed heart failure frequently. It can be because they have blockages in the blood vessels that feed their heart. It can be because they had uncontrolled high blood pressure or uncontrolled diabetes. So at the end of the day, we wind up trying to control the same risk factors that we had to control uh, that we've been talking about all day. I will say there are some genetic variants of having heart failure. Those are extremely important um, to identify and understand. And so I really would make sure that you talk to your doctor um, about your family member's heart disease so they can explain and, and uh, investigate it a little bit more. Well, I hope the answers to some of these questions have been helpful for you all today. If you have any further issues, questions, or you'd like to see a provider, you can reach our group uh, through the website, christianacare.org, and under Find a Doc, you can find Christiana Care Cardiology Consultants, and we'd be happy to make an appointment and see you in the office. If you have any other questions specifically, you can post them on the Facebook Live site, and we will try our best to answer them. Have a good day.